Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming back after lunch. I hope I don't put you to siesta. Um, uh, this is going to be my turn. I'm going to be presenting uh, hepatologic malignancies uh, 2022. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, the last ASCO meeting, there were three hematologic malignancies abstract uh, oral presentations. So it's going to be very, uh, I'm going to try to rush through the ones that I selected. Um, very hard to do that uh, uh, for in only 20 minutes. There, there was a session for lymphoid malignancies, another one for plasma cell malignancies, and a final one for uh, myeloid malignancies. Lymphoid malignancies, I chose to uh, present uh, a, a study that uh, essentially answer, uh, uh, answers the question that many patients have when they come to see you. And they tell you, you know, why can't you use drug Z or drug D if it's listed for this cancer, and you have to tell them, look, it's uh, listed for second line. And they go, like, if it's good for people who've uh, progressed uh, with my malignancy, why shouldn't it be good for me? Especially when those drugs are uh, of lesser toxicity than the first line drugs. And this study addresses exactly that. Uh, this is a SHINE study, it's a phase three study where they added ibrutinib uh, to the standard combination of prendamastin rituximab. Uh, for uh, patients with mantle cell lymphoma. These are older patients with mantle cell lymphoma. Uh, this made it as a breakthrough presentation at the New England Journal of Medicine the same day they were presenting. Uh, uh, Bendamastin rituxan uh, is a first-line uh, treatment for mantle cell lymphoma in older patients. Um, Bendamastin rituxan alone improves progression-free survival compar compared to RCHOP, and uh, it has a definitely better safety profile, in particular in elder patients. Followed by rituximab uh, maintenance, there is an improved progression-free survival than uh, with uh, Bendamastin rituxan alone. Uh, ibrutinib, on the other hand, is a once-daily uh, BTK inhibitor, bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitor, uh, that um, is extremely well tolerated uh, as far as antineoplastics go, and uh, when used on second-line therapy, is better than any of the standard treatments. So on the SHINE study, uh, they had the control arm in green, where uh, there were patients treated with bendamastin rituxan, followed by rituxan maintenance if they went into a CR or a PR, uh, or placebo, uh, which on the experimental arm uh, was ibrutinib at the dose of 560 milligrams. Uh, for those of you who are used to ibrutinib, the uh, dose for uh, mantle cell lymphoma is higher than for other malignancies, which is 420 milligrams uh, daily. And this was continued uh, uh, until progression of disease or toxicity. Uh, the uh, primary endpoint, uh, which was improved uh, uh, progression-free survival, was met. Uh, there was an improvement of progression-free um, progression survival uh, uh, that you can see here uh, 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 with a significant uh, p-value for the experimental arm uh, with the addition of ibrutinib. There was a 25% reduction in the risk of progression disease or death. Um, if you look at the response rate, though, the response rate was about the same. Um, however, the, uh, uh, the, risk, the CR rate was numerically, numerically higher on the experimental arm with ibrutinib, um, uh, but uh, it did not reach uh, statistical significance. Uh, the uh, time to next treatment, which I think is one of the clinchers, and this is one of the reasons I selected uh, this uh, presentation, is actually significantly longer. And this makes a difference uh, for patients who uh, face, uh, face actual toxic uh, treatments as the next line of treatment for this malignancy. If you can maintain them for this long uh, on a, essentially a pill a day, uh, you are actually doing much better than uh, switching to another treatment. So uh, the, for the brutinib uh, arm, uh, the 19% uh, 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 went into a subsequent therapy at second line, uh, whereas 40% on the placebo arm did. The uh, uh, adverse events uh, uh, were pretty much uh, the ones that you would expect uh, on uh, this combination. Uh, which is chemotherapy, uh, a, a, an, a, an immuno a CD20 agent, and a, a bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Uh, it's neutropenia. GI symptoms, uh, which were mostly diarrhea, were more common uh, on the experimental arm, uh, as well as nausea, rash, 
and um, um, it, it uh, really doesn't list uh, that many of uh, cardiac uh, adverse uh, emerging uh, uh, emergent adverse events as I would have expected. The overall survival is uh, uh, no different. Um, the uh, um, uh, 50 cent, uh, the, the, at uh, 84 months, uh, uh, roughly uh, between 55 and 60 percent of the patients were still alive on both arms. Uh, I don't think that they presented data of crossover. So this was a first uh, phase three trial that uh, showed that we could move a second line agent to first line and uh, obtain an improvement in progression-free survival. And it's very likely that we also would have an improvement in overall survival if we were to take into account the uh, uh, crossover uh, patients that were not mentioned. So for plasma cell malignancies, I've chosen uh, three abstracts, uh, two that address uh, uh, treatments that are now uh, the, the treatments of choice for advanced uh, 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 myeloma patients with refractory disease, and one that's treatment for uh, early stage uh, disease. Uh, the first one is a phase one study of CAR T, DDBCMA, uh, 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 CAR T cell therapy in relapse or refractory multiple myeloma. So CAR T cells are uh, engineered uh, 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 autologous uh, T cells that are uh, processed uh, for a particular patient. So these are not off-the-shelf treatments. These are treatments on which you rely first on being able to harvest uh, the cells, then to be able to process them, and then to be able to deliver them to the patients in time before they either uh, died or got sicker and couldn't receive treatment. What they have is uh, they have uh, a, a CD uh, a T cell domain that allows the immune function of these cells, and they have a domain of a tumor surface antibody against which the T cells are directed. Uh, the most common one to use, especially for myeloid or lymphoid malignancies, excuse me, for lymphoid malignancies, is CD19. What they are doing on, in this study, and this is a phase one study uh, using a synthetic um, uh, uh, chimeric uh, uh, receptor, they're directing the T cells against BCMA. BCMA is a surface antigen common on the myeloma cells, stands for B cell maturation agent. Um, and uh, this particular um, engineered receptor fuses uh, the, uh, uh, the T cell receptor with an engineered HEMA antibody directed against BCMA, and that engineered antibody is called DDBCMA. The reason why I chose uh, this particular uh, study to present, even though I'm neither a molecular biologist right now nor uh, a, a cellular therapist, is because of what we all know of CAR T cell therapy. Uh, CAR T cell therapy is a toxic treatment. It's effective, uh, but it's uh, uh, fraught with uh, two serious toxicities that can be life-threatening. Uh, if not uh, actually uh, 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 of high morbidity. One is uh, chemokine release syndrome, uh, syndrome, and the other one are the central neurologic uh, syndromes. Um, with uh, this uh, preparation, as well as with two other more that were also presented, uh, both from Chinese groups, uh, the uh, safety profile is remarkable. Uh, but more important than that is whether that's effective or not. So, at the end of the uh, um, uh, selection process, they started off with 37 patients enrolled, and they had 31 patients to evaluate for uh, efficacy. Uh, the uh, 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 groups uh, that they have at two those levels uh, are represented here. Uh, they uh, had a range of ages from 44 to 76 years of age, and that's important. Um, most of them were IgG myeloma, uh, and they had light chain myeloma as well. Um, and this is, these are the uh, uh, response rates. They had 100% overall response rate, and these responses were actually durable. Uh, 
That means uh, that they didn't have patients with progression after having an overall response. This is very impressive. Um, and 94% had a very good partial response. 71% of the patients had complete responses. Uh, the adverse event profile is uh, important to notice here. They had, uh, for cytokine release syndrome, they had 88% grade one and two. A grade one and two is actually tolerable. Most of the patients that we we'll see later needed to be treated, but grade three, they are zero. And they had no patients with grade four. Um, at the first dose level and the second dose level, they only had one patient with grade three and they didn't have any patients on grade four. So the conclusions um, uh, are that uh, CAR-T, uh, DDBCMA, uh, they use a synthetic highly stable binding domain. Uh, the adverse event profile is potentially differentiated from other CAR-T cells. Um, there, was, there were no tissue targeted toxicities, no cases of grade three or greater uh, uh, chemokine release syndrome, uh, and they had at the most grade three uh, neurologic uh, events with one case. Uh, and there was uh, no delayed neurotoxicity or Parkinson-like events, which is another side effect of CAR T cells uh, treatment. They had a 100% overall response rate um, uh, across both uh, those levels, and the uh, responses were deep and durable. Mind you, this is a phase one trial with only 31 patients, but this is extremely promising. Now. Off the shelf, can, what can we offer the patients as far as directed uh, cellular therapy-like treatments? So we have what's co what are called bispecific antibodies, where we bring a uh, anti-cell surface antigen um, in a T cell to uh, the tumor. And this is achieved with what they are called bispecific antibodies. You have a CD3 component, which attaches a T cell to bring it to a BCMA component, which attaches to the plasma cell. And this is uh, an updated uh, report from the Majestic 1 trial uh, in patients with relapsed refractory multiple myeloma. This also made it to the New England Journal of Medicine that now along with uh, CNN is a great thing, apparently. Um, and uh, this is uh, a novel uh, bispecific antibody that redirect the T cells against myeloma. The study design, you know, the, uh, the patients selected were triple, triple class uh, refractory patients that had to be, have been treated with at least three type of uh, uh, myeloma treatments. They were treated with um, uh, uh, tecl teclas teclitazumab uh, at uh, 1.5 milligrams per kilogram subcutaneously. Um, and uh, they were continued under disease progression. And this was after a step-up uh, 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 treatment. The primary endpoint was overall response rate. Uh, the treatment uh, disposition at the time of their presentation, uh, most of the patients were uh, on the uh, phase two, and uh, they had uh, 17 patients ongoing from the phase one, uh, uh, 53 patients ongoing uh, from the phase two. They had 14% uh, of patients which were older than 75. Uh, remember, multiple myeloma is a disease of old age. So this is a number that we should always look at. Um, we don't want to be biased by very young population. Uh, and uh, um, most of the patients had received at least uh, three uh, types of uh, tre uh, drug treatment, if not five. The overall response rate for this heavily pretreated group was uh, 63%. Of these, 40% uh, were CRs, and 60% uh, uh, wrong number were very good uh, partial responses. And again, uh, the reason to choose this um, uh, was, one, the durability of response, similar to a, a um, uh, T cell approach, uh, these patients had durable and prolonged responses. Um, the uh, uh, response of, at 18, for, uh, the median uh, duration of response was 18.4 months. 
and the progression free survival uh, was 11.3 uh, uh, months. The safety profile was also uh, interesting uh, because uh, other than the expected uh, hematologic uh, side effects, the uh, uh, severity of the uh, chemokine release syndrome, which happens with bispecific antibodies as much as with um, uh, CAR T cells, was actually very low. So the cytokine release syndrome, uh, there were uh, 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 mostly grade two, up to grade two uh, 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 side effects, uh, and they still needed uh, to receive treatment, as you can see. Uh, neurotoxic ev events uh, uh, were mostly uh, grade two. Uh, there was one patient with grade four, uh, with seizures, uh, with bacterial meningitis, so it's unclear whether this was uh, due to the drug or not. So, um, the clistamab uh, yields deep and durable responses, uh, the toxicities were manageable, uh, and uh, this is a new promising off-the-shelf T-cell redirecting therapy targeting BCMA for patients with uh, uh, refractory multiple myeloma. Again, this is not something that we're going to give in the, in the infusion in the clinic. These patients have to be admitted to the hospital and observed afterwards. So myelomalignancies, um, the, uh, uh, the best study that I could find uh, was this uh, randomized study between momelotinib versus danazole for patients with uh, myelofibrosis and anemia. Myelofibrosis is, is now considered a myeloproliferative neoplasm. Uh, the uh, treatment uh, goes from supportive treatment to JAK2 inhibitors. Uh, the, uh, uh, there are currently three approved JAK2 inhibitors, and all of them have as a side effect anemia. And that's a problem because these patients present with anemia. So uh, you achieve uh, in some of them uh, some prolongation of survival. You achieve control of symptoms if they are related to splenomegaly. These are patients that tend to have an enormous spleen, uh, but you cannot control anemia. Uh, momelotinib uh, targets JAK1, JAK2 in a, an intermediary of hepcidin uh, act activity, uh, which is called ACVR1. Hepcidin is kind of like a holy grail of benign hematology because it's the key molecule for the control of iron metabolism for patients with uh, non-iron deficiency anemias. And uh, uh, the, uh, the metabolism of uh, the, the physiology of hepcidin itself is difficult to understand. But when you have high hepcidin, you cannot use the iron that you have around. When your hepcidin goes lower, your iron becomes more available. Let's put it like that. With this drug, with this JAK1 inhibitor, what you're doing is you are decreasing hepcidin and making serum iron more available for hematopoiesis. And at the same time, you are, oops, excuse me. And at the same time, you're inhibiting JAK1 and JAK2, which are the uh, receptor, uh, uh, which are the activated uh, 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 tyrosine kinases uh, in action in um, uh, uh, myelofibrosis. So there's prior clinical evidence of benefit uh, in previous trials with uh, momelotinib, uh, both uh, on uh, response rate and on transfusion requirements. Uh, in these studies, uh, patients were randomized between danazole and the experimental arm of momelotinib. Uh, and uh, you can see that the symptom score rate was uh, superior in uh, the experimental arm. And more importantly, the spleen response rate was superior in the experimental arm. There were patients that got to have up to 80% of spleen size reduction. Um, uh, and to my surprise, I saw that danazole also achieved the same. And UM is, uh, 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 especially in hematology, uh, has a long history of danazole use for multiple different uh, illnesses. So we still have danazole in case patients cannot get this or tolerate this. Uh, they achieved different than uh, the other uh, JAK2 inhibitors. Uh, there was a transfusion independence rate that was achieved uh, with improvement on the mean hemoglobin. This was a trial that had a, a crossover phase. Uh, so 
uh, there was first uh, uh, an improvement in uh, anemia, which was then closed once the patients were allowed to cross over and receive the experimental drug. Um, I'm going to jump the adverse event. The overall survival was not superior, in particular since there was a, a crossover uh, a portion after uh, six months. And so in conclusion, um, for this novel JAK2 inhibit, inhibitor, uh, they uh, met all the pre-specified key uh, uh, endpoints. There were significant improvements in symptoms and spleen size and anemia. Uh, with momelotinib versus danazol, and there was a favorable safety profile towards improved overall survival. Uh, this is the first uh, and only JAK1 and JAK2 inhibitor that also decreases hepcidine through inhibition of ACVR1, and that allows this different uh, effect uh, with improvement in anemia compared to the other JAK2 inhibitors. Uh, and the thrombocytopenia was about the same or better. Uh, this is my last slide. Thank you very much. Let me introduce uh, uh, Dr. Gina D'Amaro, that's going to present for us uh, the advances in sarcoma. Good afternoon. I would like to thank the um, organizers for inviting me today and also um, the attendees and for everyone I can see and can't see online. Okay, so I'm going to talk about updates in sarcoma. I'm going to briefly talk about some updates at CTOS, which is our Connective Tissue Oncology Society um, meeting that's annual, international, ASCO, some FDA approvals, and then my um, shameless plug for our sarcoma research. Uh, so. Just a reminder, um, Repritinib was FDA approved in the fifth line setting for gastrointestinal stromal tumors two years ago uh, based on a placebo trial, so um, showing improvement in overall survival. And there was poster update at, at CTOS showing that the patients with the crossover did um, have benefit and there was some prolonged benefit as well. Uh, with a long per, um, duration of response. And then uh, published in several uh, papers were in that trial, patients, if they progressed, could have BID dosing. And so it does show benefit of BID dosing in about 30% of the patients. And so that has, and we also had a poster at ASCO in real time, uh, talking about our particular patients that we had analyzed and had similar um, results with an additional um, PFS uh, uh, from 5.5 to 8.3 months. So the NCCN guidelines were updated for GIST. Uh, first of all, um, discussing that neoadjuvant, if you are supposed to treat any GIST patient with uh, systemic therapy that you that it's really need to be getting molecular testing. Um, also adding that in the fifth line in the fourth line setting upon progressive disease with repritinib, you can go to BID. And um, and again, um, if you, once you send your tumor specimen for molecular testing, you can, you can send for just kit and PGGF or you can do the whole uh, next-gen sequencing, and if you see an uh, SDH-deficient GIST, um, which were used to be wild-type, but now we've found that these wild-type actually have gene mutations, SDH-deficient and NF1, that we want to send those patients to genetic counseling. And actually at ASCO, I didn't, I, you know, interest of time, there was a, a nice session that I attended and seen about 25% of sarcoma patients with hereditary mutations. So we're really encouraging that we send our um, sarcoma patients to genetic counselors. Um, uh, to move on, this was also presented at ASCO. We had the trial here. Uh, Dr. Trent was the PI. And this is a drug, PLX9486, in combination with Sutin for patients that progressed on GIST. And this is a novel TKI that 
inhibits the primary KIT mutations, exon 9, but also the activation loop, um, which is exon 17 and, and, and 18. And the sutin is um, good against exon 9 and also exon 13 and 14. So there's synergy there. And you could see in this area when you could see, oops, sorry, I knew this was going to happen. OK. So you can, you can see that sutin, again, works in exon 9 and 11 and 13 and 14, the activation loops, but there's resistance in the um, in the 1718, whereas if you combine, um, you can have, you can elude those resistant mutations. And the overall response rate was 20% with a clinical benefit rate of 80%. And there were durable responses. So it was well tolerated. And we are actually having a phase three trial that we just opened with the combination versus sunitinib alone. Um, the, also, there was an ASCO plenary set series where uh, we participated in this trial as well. It was the Intrigue trial. So currently, sunitinib is approved for second line GIST. And so it was a phase three randomized to repritinib, which is now, as I talked about, approved for the fourth line. It took it sooner to see if it can be um, more effective in the second line than sudenitinib. So patients were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion. Here you see sudenitinib was given at 50 milligrams um, four weeks on, three weeks off, which is a little bit more toxic than the standard dosing that we give, 37.5 continuous. And um, there was no statistically significant. The, 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 the survival curves were basically uh, on top of each other. Um, so uh, it, because this trial was not a, um, it was a superiority and, and a non-inferiority, it did not get approved and it was, is re result is negative. However, it did show that there were improved um, tolerability in the repritinib arm um, versus the sudenitinib arm, but unfortunately that was not the primary endpoint of the study. So right now, um, the conclusion is that sunitinib is still our um, standard second-line therapy. But you can consider um, moving repritinib earlier if a patient is not tolerating the sunitinib. Um, and then we have the ASCO highlights. I, I did give the ASCO highlights of the day session, so I'll just kind of recap of the things. So this was... We did have a plenary session. It was right before the Destiny um, standing ovation session. So um, our, this, it was positive data. And so it basically, this study was looking at second-line therapy for refractory Ewing sarcoma patients. And we have limited um, treatment options. And it was several arms were in the study, gemcitabine, taxotere, cyclophosphamide, topotecan as well, and, though, and, um, the, and Vin Christina Rinotecan Timidar. Those, the Vin Christina Rinotecan Timidar and Gemcitamine Taxotere showed to be inferior. And so this was the report of the hydrocyphosamide versus Topotecan cyclophosamide. And the ifosamide was superior with statistically significant at 5.7 months versus 3.5 months and improved um, six months survival. But this does show, and the secondary outcomes improved overall survival, actually 50% improvement in overall survival with the hydrocyphosamide. So it is effective in first line and relapse. Now, we've been doing this for a long time, but we, this was the first controlled evidence study of its superiority in the relapse. So it will most likely be added to the NCCN guidelines, but the survival outcomes highlights the urgency to find more active and less toxic agents. And we're still holding out for, for, for some better agents. And one day, we will have a standing ovation at ASCO, hopefully soon. Um, this was actually another trial that we, we were involved in, and this um, abstract was pulled to a special circulating t tumor DNA session at ASCO. This was very interesting because we also had a, a study that got a poster um, uh, presentation as well, our group, uh, Bialik et al., um, 
uh, one of our fellows uh, was on the podium for that. Um, but this was um, Cesar Serrano out of Spain, and he presented the Voyager trial. We were involved with this Voyager trial here, um, and this was third line trying avapritinib versus regorafenib, which is the standard third line therapy. And so um, it was a, it was one to one third and fourth line gist, and um, looking at avapritinib versus regorafenib, those studies show that it was again it was equal efficacy, and so this trial was considered negative because again it was a non inferiority trial. Um, so regorafenib is still the standard third line, but what was interesting was that we looked at the ctDNA, and the ctDNA was very important because we really showed the survival benefits, both median and uh, median PFS, with the trend toward uh, overall survival in those patients that received regorafenib that had exon 13, which is the ATP binding uh, pocket domain and also improved survival with the activation loop domain, which this one we felt we kind of knew that a little bit beforehand, that avapritinib was a little bit weak in the eight, in this exon 17 and regorafenib, but with the exon 13, it was more of a surprise. Uh, so this was the first study to address the utility of ctDNA sequencing and advanced GIST in the context of a large international clinical trial. And, um, and it also, this hybrid capture plasma sequencing detects primary and resistant mutations. And, um, and so the, it does correlate with outcomes in the pretreated GIST and identify um, and identification of the ATP binding pocket in kit negatively correlates with avapritinib activity. And we had similar findings in our study when we looked at our patients at, at Sylvester and um, patients with, um, that when we looked at patients with exon 13 mutations that had superior outcomes with sunitinib over any other treatment. So again, it, it shows the importance of getting um, a ctDNA upon progression. And so that's what we're doing here at our institution, and I think it's going to be rolling out um, to other centers. This, this trial was an interesting trial. We, um, neoadjuvant and adjuvant chemotherapy for soft tissue sarcomas, excluding Ewing sarcoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, and likely synovial sarcoma, um, still remains to be controversial. Um, because of the heterogeneity of the sarcomas, um, different um, natural histories, different sensitivities to chemotherapy. So this trial was um, a, an update on a trial that was done looking at neoadjuvant chemotherapy, comparing the standard arm. And this is out of uh, Milan in Europe, so they use epirubicin versus doxorubicin in combination with ifosamide versus um, kind of tailoring uh, the chemotherapy based on histology. So they tailored it. Mixoid liposarcoma is particularly sensitive to trabectidin, lyomyosarcoma, et cetera. Those other arms did not show in uh, superiority, so that those arms were closed. But it was looking promising for the trabectidin arm, so they actually amended the protocol to say, let's not do superiority, let's do non-inferiority, which I think is an endpoint that's um, underutilized, as you see in those other two trials, because had they been um, a non-inferiority, maybe they would have been given options in late earlier lines. But anyway, so it did show um, uh, disease-free survival, similar, it was not statistically significant versus the standard arm and the tailored arm and um, uh, most imposable overall survival. And you can see the overall survival is actually much higher. We use predictive uh, and, and the toxicity is, is lower. And so we actually um, use predictive markers, uh, predictive tools. We use a nomograms and we use a circulator to figure out which patients can benefit from neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And 
If you look at these survival curves, if I were to take at 90% in a high-risk patient, that's much higher. So it does show that chemotherapy um, can can likely improve survival, but we're just um, you know lacking the the large phase three trials. This is another trial, and I call it the leader because I think this is probably the highlight of the. Of, of ASCO, unfortunately, but it was a combination of lenvatinib and aribulin in advanced liposarcoma and leiomyosarcoma. And basically, patients, it was, it, they had different uh, dose levels, but the dose limiting toxicity um, made the, the final dose of the lenvatinib was 14 milligrams a day, and aribulin was 1.1. And and you see, this is a nice waterfall plot. Um, and so the majority of patients had some sort of tumor shrinkage, both leiomyosarcoma and liposarcoma, and only three out of the 30 actually progressed, and actually only one had um, increased tumor size. The other two progression were new METs. So um, they are going to be uh, developing, hopefully will be involved in developing the phase three trial. We do have to look, aribulin is approved um, for liposarcoma. FDA approved and with a median PFS of 2.6 months. And here this median PFS is 8.5 months with improved overall survival, but it's a different patient population. So they'll have to really, when they, when they design the trial, make sure that they look at all that information when they're guessing the survival curves. This is also a palbociclib a phase two trial looking at palbociclib in, D it, in, in CDK4 overexpressing non-dedifferentiated liposarcoma because actually palbociclib was first evaluated in DDIF lipo back and published in 2010 before they said, oh, maybe we should try it in breast cancer. And then, and it's actually, you know, grandfathered in into the NCCN guidelines and we do use palbociclib and DDIF lipo. So this is excluded those patients and looked at other uh, a DDIF, uh, other MDM2 expressing, I'm um, sorry, CDK4 over expressing tumors. And the PFS wasn't bad at 4.2 months, and the median uh, six month PFS. Uh, six-month PFS rate was uh, uh, 30%, and the median overall survival was 12 months. And you can see here that the patients, as expected, the patients with high levels, higher levels of CDK4 expression did have improved uh, PFS and OS. So this is where I have my shameless plug for the TAPER trial. Um, we do, there is a, a beneciclib arm, so let's think about uh, those patients. Um, and, and then, uh, again, uh, the, the, the histologies for this was solitary fibrous tumor, which those, those patients um, do, some of them can have slower growing tumors, but some can be quite aggressive, and leiomyosarcoma had the best uh, PFS, so this is definitely something um, to consider. So take-home points, hydrocyphosamide is confirmed best option for relapsed Ewing patient if no clinical trials are available. Consider mutation testing analysis on all just patients. Trebectidin can be considered for myxoid liposarcomas in patients who need neoadjuvant chemotherapy and predicted to not tolerate standard anthracycline and ifosamide chemotherapy. The combination of lenvatinib and aribulin is promising, warrants confirmatory randomized trial. Palbociclib showed efficacy in non-dedifferentiated liposarcoma sarcoma patients with CDK4 overexpression with improved survival if high CDK4 levels. And just a short plug, we did get one FDA approval of NAB serolimus in patients with malignant per, uh, perivascular epithelioid cell tumors or pecomas. Um, and this was originally presented at ASCO in 2019. So it does show it takes a, we learn the data in ASCO and then, oh, three years later it gets FDA approved, but whatever, it happened. Anyways, um, you know, uh, patients get, it's an IV, get on days one and eight 
overall response rates was 39%, and um, two patients did get a CR. And the durable response, the, the duration of response was not yet reached, um, but among the responders, 67% had um, a lasting uh, response of over 12 months. So this is definitely promising, and you can see the nice uh, waterfall plot there that was published uh, earlier uh, last year. And uh, before I uh, talk about our clinical trials, I ran out of time to add my slides, but um, at Sylvester we did publish a lot of papers. We have Dr. Uh, Fran Hornacek, our uh, esteemed uh, chair of orthopedics and um, uh, orthopedic oncology here. If you Google, he's had about, um, uh, just in this past year, 20, 20 publications, one on organoids, looking at DDIF lipo, very exciting. Um, Dr. Trent in our Sylvester group, we've published uh, many papers, so uh, maybe I'll add that into my slides later. But And then I just want to go over um, some, oops, did I run out of time? This is what happens, I ran out of time. No, I stopped myself, okay. I think I pressed this thing and then, okay, here we go. Um, so we do have several clinical trials. You know, we were kind of on hold with COVID and we had all these in the pipeline and now they're, they're all open and we're really excited. Um, this is the Repritinib in combination with the CYP2CA probe substrate for advanced GIST. We have a foghorn trial that FDH609, which works um, downstream from the SSX chromosomal translocation uh, fusion product of synovial sarcoma. Um, we have this NYESO um, compound that uh, reported last year um, was T cell engineer NYESO, but patients had to be HLA-A2. And we were unable to enroll patients in Miami because we don't have a lot of HLA-A2 type patients around. So now this is um, exclusive. Uh, we don't, doesn't have to be uh, based on your HLA type. So that's very good inclusive. Uh, we have um, conventional chondrosarcomas, um, and then we, again, we have the trial that we talked about, um, the, the GIST trial with Sutin versus uh, the combination of the CGT uh, plus Sutin, and then um, versus Sutin alone. We also have an FGFR um, inhibitor receptor for SDH, oops, uh, that's a typo there. One typo, I have to fire the editor, which is me. Um, and, then, um, and then we have the phase three trial of melodematan, which took me forever to pronounce, uh, versus trabectidin in patients with DDIF lipo. So I just want to thank you and you know, thank my amazing uh, sarcoma team. And um, we'll take questions after Dr. Lusick speaks. Well, we're getting there. We have uh, two more presentations. Uh, uh, the next presentation is a video presentation by Dr. Gerald Sof. Uh, he wasn't able to make it today. Um, uh, but uh, Dr. Sof is uh, the uh, new uh, uh, director of the benign hematology program at uh, Sylvester Cancer Center. Uh, his expertise is in uh, uh, thrombosis in particular and cancer-associated thrombosis, both treatment and prevention. Uh, he is going to present an update on cancer-associated thrombosis, following which we have uh, Dr. Uh, Bilosic uh, uh, on uh, uh, urologic malignancies. No, no, after this, uh, after this presentation. Good afternoon, this is Dr. Gerald Soff. I'm Chief of the General Hematology Service at the University of Miami, Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center. We're gonna be focusing today in our talk um, on cancer-associated thrombosis and update on treatment. And here are my disclosures. So it's been well known for many years that cancer predisposes to thrombosis. It's also been well recognized that patients with cancer who have a venous thromboembolic event have a much poorer prognosis, which is shown here. So if we look at the hazard ratio of mortality of one in the general population, patients with a venous thromboembolic event have a hazard ratio of mortality of about two and a half fold. Patients who have cancer 
have about a seven and a half fold risk of mortality. The patients with cancer and venous thromboembolic events have a 31 fold higher risk of mortality than the general population and markedly more uh, markedly higher than thrombosis or cancer alone. I would emphasize though, that most of these patients are not dying from the thrombosis itself. Some do, but the vast majority of death in these patients is from a more aggressive cancer. And indeed has become recognized that cancer associated thrombosis is a marker for more aggressive, thrombo uh, more aggressive cancer biology. But for the rest of the presentation, we're gonna be focusing on updates on management. So it's been known for many years now, over 20 years, that war using warfarin in patients with cancer is extremely problematic. So this is just shown here from a paper from Paolo Prandoni and colleagues, showing that patients with cancer have a much higher risk of recurrent thrombosis than those without cancer, over threefold higher. They also have a high risk of bleeding compared to patients without cancer. And this is when warfarin was the standard of care. Why is warfarin so difficult to use? Well, as you can imagine, many things affect dr warfarin drug levels, drug-drug interactions, malnutrition, anorexia changes in dietary intake, nausea, vomiting, liver dysfunction. Well, these are all very, very common in cancer patients. In addition, there's a common need to interrupt anticoagulation for procedures, surgery, or thrombocytopenia, also making it quite problematic to titrate warfarin safely and effectively. Warfarin was really put to rest in the setting of um, cancer-associated thrombosis following the CLOT study in 2003 by Agnes Lee and colleagues in the New England Journal of Medicine. And they, they took patients who had cancer and a venous thromboembolic event, either DVT and or PE. All of the patients received standard low molecular weight heparin with daltaparin for five to seven days. And then they were randomized to six months of warfarin with a standard target of target INR of 2.5, or they were randomized to low molecular weight heparin with 200 units per kilogram sub-Q for one month, and then 150 units per kilogram to complete the five months. And as I said, this was all with daltaparin as the low molecular weight heparin. And what they showed was there was almost a 50% lower rate of um, of recurrent thrombosis with deltaparin compared to warfarin, the hazard ratio was 0.48. And there was a small but not significant increase in major bleeding. And this is just shown here in graphic form. You can see really from the very beginning when the patients were randomized to deltaparin versus warfarin, the effectiveness lines diverged, going out to um, uh, beyond six months. And, but what was interesting is if you look at death from all causes, even though the anticoagulation was more effective in preventing recurrent thrombosis, it did not have an impact on the all-cause death or cancer-related death in the patients. Several related studies were done with daltaparin, anoxaparin, and tinsaparin, and shown here. And they all were showing similar kinds of findings, that with low molecular weight heparin, there was a significantly lower risk of recurrent thrombosis compared to warfarin, and there might have been a small but not significant increased risk of bleeding. So low molecular weight heparins became the standard of care, standard practice in 2003 for treatment of cancer associated thrombosis. While the, the low molecular weight heparin was um, preferable and certainly more effective, it was remaining very, very burdensome. First of all, it wasn't perfect. There was still about seven to 8% recurrent thromboses in six months. There was also about four to 6% major bleeding, which is real burdensome numbers. And it was also very expensive. A month of therapeutic dosing of low molecular weight heparin at the time was about $3,000 a month. And I would ask, uh, add that the biggest burden was that the shots really hurt. It's not just a small little needle, but the, the drug is dissolved in a solution that contains alcohol. And that is very, very caustic and burns the patient's uh, subcutaneous tissue and the patients are miserable from those shots if they have to take them on an ongoing basis. So that led to a quest for an alternative. Is there a pill for that? Is there a oral anticoagulant? Well, warfarin was not acceptable. At the time, the only alternative was low molecular weight heparin. And then the direct oral anticoagulants, the DOACs came out 
beginning in 2012, they were approved, the first was approved for use in venous thromboembolica disease. And there's right now five lumiliquid, uh, sorry, five DOACs available, rivaroxaban, apixaban, adoxaban, and patrixaban. These all target factor 10A. And there's the bigotran, which, factor, which targets uh, thrombin or factor 2A. Adoxaban and patrixaban are used, some of patrixaban is very rarely used, but most of the research and most of what we'll be talking about is rivaroxaban, apixaban, and some studies with adoxaban. The bigotran has never been studied in cancer patients, so we won't be discussing that. So while there was um, standard of care was low molecular weight heparin, the first of the DOACs, rivaroxaban, was approved for treatment of venous thromboembolic disease in 2012. That was based on two important studies, the Einstein DVT and the Einstein PE trials, both of which showed that well, upfront rivaroxaban was not inferior to the standard of practice of low molecular weight heparin followed by warfarin. But this is for a general population. Cancer patients were included, but they were not using low molecular weight heparin as the comparator arm. So while rivaroxaban was FDA approved for DVT and treatment, and the approval did not exclude cancer patients, there was not abundant or adequate data in the cancer patients to assess safety and efficacy. So with my colleagues and I at Sloan Kettering in New York, we developed a treatment algorithm for use of rivaroxaban for treatment of cancer-associated thrombosis. As I said, it was FDA approved for this indication, but there was a data gap. So we decided to provide a clinical pathway to our colleagues and to monitor effectiveness and safety. So here's the eligibility or inclusion criteria. Creatinine clearance less than 30 was a relative contraindication abnormal liver function, uh, abnormalities of the stomach or small bowel that could adversely impact absorption, antiplatelet agents besides low-dose aspirin, significant drug interactions, and as I emphasize here, GI or GU luminal pathology. We'll talk about that in a second. At the time, we didn't have reassurance that it would be safe in patients with brain lesions, so we excluded those, and as we'll talk about later, uh, untreated brain metastases is now not an absolute contraindication to anticoagulation with the DOAC. So why are we so concerned about GI or GU luminal pathology? Well, these are direct oral anticoagulants. They don't require a cofactor like low molecular weight heparin, and they don't require metabolism in the liver like warfarin does. If a patient takes a DOAC, as <clears throat> shown here, it will start to dissolve in the stomach very shortly. And if there's a source of inflammation, such as an ulcer or gastric tumor, that drug will be immediately active in the luminal content and will have a higher risk of bleeding. We did not wait to see this in clinical trials. We just anticipated this and excluded those patients from recommending, recommending a DOAC. Similarly, in the kidneys, the DOACs are all cleared, at least in part in the kidneys. Uh, Apixaban has the lowest, but even then it has renal clearance of sufficient quantities to be biologically active. So we anticipated that patients who had active urinary tract luminal pathology, like a kidney stone or a renal cell carcinoma or a bladder cancer should not be getting a DOAC. Low molecular weight heparins, such as daltaparin and anoxaparin are also cleared in the kidneys, but unless there's significant proteinuria with antithrombin, the low molecular weight heparins will not be biologically active. So patients with GI or urinary tract luminal pathology, we did not recommend use of the DOACs. But this was a quality assessment initiative. We educated the doctors, but whoever was treated was studied, even if they were um, uh, inappropriately uh, given rivaroxaban at the time. We use standard dosing, but one thing I want to emphasize is that for patients over the age of 75, we did recommend a reduced dose of 10 milligrams twice daily instead of the standard 15 milligrams twice daily, and then maintenance of 15 milligrams once daily. We've published this and we validated this, but I wanna emphasize this is not per the FDA approved guidelines and not all of my colleagues would uh, follow this recommendation. Um, we also know from uh, past experience that in the setting of thrombocytopenia, 
cancer patients or any patient needs a dose reduction of anticoagulation. And therefore, we followed a similar guidelines that we did with anoxaparin. Under 25,000, we held anticoagulation. 25 to 50,000, we used half dose or reduced dose. And above 50,000, we used full dose. And this has been published now in 2017 and a follow-up patient uh, follow-up paper in 2019. And this is just showing the cumulative uh, evidence of safety and effectiveness. So if we look at the recurrent VTE rate, this was a 1,072 patient cohort. The recurrent rate was 4.2%. And if you remember the, the prospective studies with low molecular weight heparin, the rates of recurrent thrombosis were actually higher. Major bleeding was low at only 2.2%. Um, and this is just showing uh, the clinically relevant non-major bleeding. All-cause mortality is high, but this simply reflects that these are almost all patients with metastatic cancer. And this is in line with what other studies have shown. So we didn't see an adverse signal on mortality. But I want to emphasize here our cohort over age of 75. We had a fairly good number of 182 patients. And what we saw is using our dosing algorithm, recurrent thrombosis and major bleeding rates were both comparable to the general population and the younger population. So I do recommend um, for my patients and my colleagues, this modified dosing algorithm I talked about, but I wanna emphasize that this is not per the FDA approved guidelines. One of the reasons we started with a, uh, a quality assessment quality improvement initiative in 2013 is I anticipated it would take a number of years before a randomized clinical trial comparing any of the DOACs to low molecular weight heparin was written, funded, patients enrolled and reported out. And I was pretty close. The first paper on a DOAC for treatment of thrombosis and cancer based on a randomized clinical trial came out in 2017. And that study used a dox, everyone was randomized to low molecular weight heparin for five days and then randomized to adoxaban versus daltaparin. Adoxaban, as I said, is one of the DOACs. So this study was a little bit um, reminiscent of the clot study that everyone got low molecular weight heparin first. If you remember the papers I showed you, patients could get rivaroxaban upfront. So this is a little bit different here. And what they showed was they used a combined endpoint of recurrent thrombosis or major bleeding. So um, that was their powering, that was their, um, uh, their goal. And indeed they showed uh, doxaban was not inferior to daltaparin using the combined endpoint of VTE recurrence versus uh, and or major bleeding. However, what you can see here is the recurrent VTE rate was actually lower than patients getting daltaparin, but major bleeding was higher both by around 3%, but the recurrent thrombosis did not reach statistical significance, but the increased bleeding did reach increased significance. So um, we looked further and the authors looked further. Um, at, well, I'll come back to that. So a number of studies have now been done with um, rivaroxaban, adoxaban, and apixaban, comparing the DOACs to the low molecular weight heparins. And what you can see here is that there was a trend in all the studies and in the um, meta-analysis of all the studies, there was a significant uh, superiority uh, of the DOACs to low molecular weight heparin as far as effectiveness goes. The hazard ratio of, um, or the risk ratio of recurrent thrombosis was 0 0.62. So about a 40% reduction in recurrent thrombosis. Major bleeding was about the same. Uh, one of the studies was almost spot on the same. Uh, some were a little bit lower, some was a little bit higher, but the feeling was there was not a significant difference. And if you look at the, um, um, if you look at the uh, confidence intervals, they overlap one. So we can say at least in the aggregate, um, it's not significantly worse, um, but, um, another, a number of studies, which I'm not going to go through here, have indicated that almost all of the increased risk of bleeding was in patients with GI or GU luminal lesions. As I said, stomach cancer, uh, gastroesophageal uh, esophageal cancer, renal, bladder, things like that. So one should use, one should be comfortable using the, the direct oral anticoagulants for treatment of cancer-associated thrombosis, 
but one should not use them in patients with GI or GU luminal pathology. And that's become sort of standard practice these days. So um, this is from a paper that my colleagues and I wrote. The appropriate question is not which anticoagulant is better, i.e. a DOAC versus low molecular weight heparin. The appropriate question is in a given patient, which anticoagulant is appropriate? And that's led to marked improvement in quality of life by allowing patients to avoid the twice, once or twice daily injections of low molecular weight heparin with preservation or superiority of effectiveness and excluding the GI and GU pathology, no signal for worse uh, bleeding rates. The second thing I wanted to discuss is um, how to handle anticoagulation in patients who have chemo-induced thrombocytopenia. So anticoagulation is often indicated as we talked about um, and is very important, but it has an increased risk of bleeding. In addition, CIT or chemo-induced thrombocytopenia also can have an increased risk of bleeding. So how do we balance these out? So there really was no guidance. Agnes Lee in 2009 published a review article on management of thrombosis. And she said that there's little literature on the management, but she proposed uh, an algorithm similar to this, which is over 50,000 full dose. This is low molecular weight heparins, 25 to 50 half dose and under 25 held tempor hold temporarily. Sometimes one can use platelet transfusions to facilitate an ongoing anticoagulation, but it's impractical to do this um, because of a very short duration of, the, of improvement. But if you have a, someone with severe nadir, for instance, a bone marrow transplant who has a massive PE, you sometimes will have to keep the platelets up at least to 25 to allow some anticoagulant being given. So we did a quality assessment initiative at Memorial when I was there. And what we showed was that about 95% of the doctors were modifying the anticoagulation in patients who had CIT, which is actually very, very good for guideline adherence. And what we showed was very gratifying. So during the period of anticoagulation modify, uh, modification, there were no recurrent thrombosis and no major bleeding. You can't do much better than that. So you can't do statistics on nothing, something that didn't occur. There was only one major hemorrhage, and this was in a patient who fell, hit his back, and developed a retroperitoneal hematoma. And this was on the third day of thrombocytopenia when his platelet count was only 28,000. And the oncologists were not yet aware of his thrombocytopenia, so the dose of the uh, anoxaparin had not yet been reduced. Uh, there was no major bleeding, just routine, or not routine, but co bleeding common uh, to patients with thrombocytopenia, such as mucocutaneous bleeding episodes. So this has now been incorporated into the current NCCN guidelines, which I'm showing here. Um, and this is for anoxaparin. Over 50,000, you can use um, full dose anticoagulants, either a milligram per kilogram twice a day or 1.5 milligrams per kilogram once daily. Between 25 and 50,000 platelets, you can use half dose anoxaparin. And under 25,000, you should hold the anoxaparin and if there's a need for a critical need for anticoagulation, you can support with platelet transfusions. And I would note that the NCCN currently says that um, we don't have adequate data yet for whether these dosing guidelines will hold up with the DOACs or not. Um, and I know there's an interest in doing some ongoing research to address that question. And here's the, uh, the full page from the NCCN, but I just highlighted the section here. So thank you very much. I, uh, I uh, enjoyed presenting here. I will. I had to do this virtually because I will not be available in person. But please reach out to me for any questions. Thank you very much. I'll tell Dr. Sov that you're clapped. Thank you very much. Um, I'm I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Mario Vilusic, uh, who's going to present uh, uh, from the GU Oncology Group uh, at Sylvester. Uh, he's going to present to us advances in urologic oncology. Thank you. You're welcome. So I'm the last one. Usually they say the dessert comes at the end, so I guess you're going to join this presentation. Uh, so uh, it's very challenging to summarize everything in one, what happened last year in geomalignancy, so I selected a couple of 
highlights for prostate cancer, bladder, adrenal cortical, and kidney cancer. So prostate cancer has the most exciting things, and there are three main events happening that we are learning about intensification of treatment for prostate cancer, combination of PARP inhibitors with uh, antiandrogens, and there's new drug radioligand, uh, lutetium-117. In bladder cancer, it's non-muscle invasive, it's a quilt interleukin-15, uh, phase two, three trial. It was the first ever adjuvant mitotain trial for adrenocortical cancer reported last year, and the adjuvant pembrolizumab for kidney cancer. So the piece one was a European study, multicenter randomized open label phase three study, which uh, actually asked the question, should we add abiraterone to standard of care, which was a hormonal therapy and docetaxel chemotherapy for prostate cancer. It had the four uh, arms, they included patients who had de novo metastatic disease. They have more than one lesion on bone skin. And then within three months of starting hormonal therapy, uh, they were randomized to this clinical trial. And uh, what they found that was really impressive uh, that they are able to improve survival of the patient. Uh, as you can see, it's a very busy slide, but on the, uh, the last two uh, bottom ones are the most important one that show the majority of patients who drive the benefit were patients with high volume metastatic disease. And those patients are uh, who have like several uh, metastatic lesion visceral disease, while patients who did not have uh, the oligometastatic, they did not derive a lot of benefit from this. In terms of safety, uh, you know, we're always concerned when we are combining multiple therapies, but it was very, very safe in terms of uh, side effect. There's nothing unexpected that so had similar uh, side effect as a standard of care. So uh, there were lots of debate. That was presented at ESMO uh, last year in 2021 uh, in Europe, and there was lots of discussion, should we incorporate this in our daily practice? Because daily practice before September of last year was either we give them docetaxel or chemotherapy, or we give patient abiraterone, but they never combine together. And there's a lot, even now, there's still problem with insurance company approving both treatments. So you have to do sequential treatment. We give chemotherapy first and then abiraterone because insurance company company will not pay for it. Uh, and in terms of uh, subgroup analysis, it seems that you know, across the board, it doesn't matter which category patients are, they were like a substantial benefit of having uh, chemotherapy and abiraterone early on for those patients. So uh, GUASCO, so four months later, there was a GUASCO in San Francisco, and they asked a very similar question. So instead of using uh, biraterone, they used darolutamide, which is a similar drug, antiandrogen. And then basically they took the patient who had just diagnosed with hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, uh, who are a candidate for chemotherapy and uh, hormonal therapy, and they just randomized them to uh, darolutamide, plus docetaxel, plus hormonal therapy, or just placebo or docetaxel. And they had several uh, secondary endpoints. A primary endpoint was overall survival. So it was a big deal and see like what's happening with those patients. And it was a positive study. So basically, uh, it was quite dramatic. The overall survival was not reached with uh, darolutamide, and placebo was 48.9 months, which is standard for charted. And that is really exciting. Now we have two studies uh, indicating that metastatic uh, de novo hormone-sensitive prostate cancer should be offered triplet therapy. So we move from hormonal therapy alone 2015 was docetaxel or abiraterone, and now in 2022, we do triplet therapy and with dramatic improvement in overall survival. And this was a time to uh, develop into castration-resistant disease. The castration-sensitive disease is not deadly disease. Nobody dies when it's castration-sensitive patient. But we want to delay onset of castration-resistant disease, and that's what majority of improvement happened over survival, delaying on onset of castration-resistant disease. In terms of safety, it was relatively safe. There are no uh, unknown side effects reported here, and that was a publication published after simultaneously with the GEOASCO presentation was presented um, uh, published in uh, New England Journal of Medicine. So in summary, this was a big deal this year, that addition of abiraterone to uh, hormonal therapy and docetaxel was associated with significant improvement in 2.5 year in, in median uh, progression-free survival, 25% reduction in the risk of death, and survival of benefit of more than 1.5 year in high-risk, uh, high-volume patient while darolutamide plus ADT plus docetaxel also prolong overall survival versus placebo, and 
median overall survival was not reached, and uh, the overall survival benefit was across the board, regardless of low volume, high volume disease. So uh, adverse events were similar, so no difference, it's very non-toxic, and uh, so treatment intensification, uh, abiraterone or darlutamide plus ADT plus docetaxel should become a new standard of care for hormone-sensitive uh, prostate cancer metastatic disease. So in 2020, in May, two PARP inhibitors were approved for prostate cancer, Olaparib and Rucoparib. And we learned in 2020 that about 30% of castration-resistant prostate cancer do have DNA repair mutations. And uh, it's now a requirement that we have sequencing those patients. And if they have uh, BRCA1, BRCA2, ATM, and other mutation from the pathway, we should offer them Olaparib or Rucoparib. So the both FE approved. So the question was asked, should we intensify? Uh, so uh, the PROPEL trial was presented uh, uh, basically uh, also in GEOASCO, uh, and they added abiraterone plus olaparib as frontline therapy for castration resistant. So this is not castration sensitive disease, castration resistant disease. And the primary endpoint was progression free survival. So this was all comers, regardless of DNA repair pathway. So they did sequence those patients, they learned, but they were not a requirement for the patient to draw the study. So it was a positive study, which was kind of surprising because we are moving towards precision medicine. We are looking for genetic mutation. They want to target, uh, but it was lots of debate. So how come uh, you know all comers are benefiting from this treatment? I mean, it's good for company because they can sell the drug with every, to everybody, but for uh, for patient, Mia, kind of it seems a little bit uh, you know step forward, backward, not step forward. But it was a positive study and was lots of attention. Uh, it was not overall survival data. There was a you know, progression-free survival, but was a uh, hazard ratio of 0 0.66, and median progression-free survival was uh, went from 16.6 .6 to 24.8 months. Uh, and then overall survival was not reached yet, so we don't have overall survival data, but we're expecting uh, to have uh, you know, maybe follow-up study results next year and two years. In terms of the toxicity of this combination, it doesn't seem, you know, it seems more toxic because, you know, Lapra itself has something, but the main one which was observed, I highlight in yellow, it's risk of uh, thromboembolic disease. Uh, which is not typically seen with Olapra, but in this combination seems that it's more prevalent that we had a pulmonary embolism, a venous thromboembolism, like in uh, more patients. Uh, this is kind of combination-related side effect. Uh, so the same meeting, at was another trial, was magnitude trial, and instead of Olaparib, they used Niraparib, which is also PARP inhibitor. So they have a little bit different trial design, and so they have actually, they, strat they have two groups, so have patients who had mutation and people who don't have uh, DNA repair pathway mutation, and they gave them Niraparib plus Abiraterone or Niraparib uh, or placebo. And the other one was the same treatment, just they are kind of divided into Two groups, so they didn't take all comers, they separated the patient. And biomarker negative patient did not have a benefit. The only biomarker positive patient, they have significant uh, uh, vertical loss progression free survival benefit, they went from uh, 10.9 months to 16.9 months, a so six months improvement. So uh, you're going to ask me the question, and I, we, it was also discussed, so how you explain this? You have two trials presented at the same time, two different PARP inhibitors, and uh, this one is working, this one it doesn't work. So in summary, uh, it is really now unclear to many of us practicing, uh, you know, because of these two studies, one positive, one negative, should be really offering PARP inhibitors to everybody, or to only to people who have DNA repo repair pathway mutation. And uh, you know, among the uh, experts in the field, there's still, still there's not wild come wildly accepted that we should offer PARP to everybody because it's a toxic. So I think currently what is offered is to patient, if patient have DNA repair pathway mutation, we offer all or near upper with uh, abiraterone, but I don't think it's prime time to give this to everybody. We'll see what the FDA will say, but uh, you know you don't have still the package label uh, update on, on those combinations. 
And the third uh, highlight for the prostate cancer is lutetium PSMA uh, 617. So PSMA is protein expressed on the prostate cancer. About 90% of prostate cancer patients will express this protein, but there are also a couple other organs will express PSMA, such as heart, salivary glands, and some bone marrow. And they generated the radioactive ligand with lutetium attached to PSMA, and then PSMA binds, uh, this ligand binds to PSMA, uh, goes to, uh, and with endocytosis to a cell and destroys the DNA by radiation. So uh, the, the lutetium PSMA has been uh, used more outside the United States. It was approved in Germany and in Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. So Novartis is the company who has it. Uh, so they run the vision trial in order to have registration in the United States. Uh, so the vision trial was presented last year and they used patients who had one post-chemotherapy, post-antiandrogen, so this is a third-line therapy for castration-resistant prostate cancer. So they randomized them two to one to lutetium, uh, given as a six doses and the follow-up, uh, versus whatever standard of care uh, the treating oncologist would recommend to the patient. And this was a positive study, uh, median progression-free survival, uh, I'm sorry, median overall survival, uh, improved from 11.3 uh, months to 15.3 months. It was four months improvement. It's similar to all other approved agents for castration-resistant prostate cancer, leading to FDA approval of this agent in March of this year. Uh, in terms of toxicity, uh, as expected, bone marrow toxicity is uh, seen there. Uh, but uh, one that I would like to put your attention, draw attention to is a dry mouth because it's on salivary glands. This radiation destroys the salivary glands. So majority of these are grade two, but the grade two salivary <laughs> xerostomy is pretty bad. You know, it's not like grade two hypertension when patients don't feel anything. This is really affecting their ability to talk. They have to drink and. Uh, when they eat, uh, so, but it is really good for patients who are uh, like running out of other options. So we are uh, having this available at Sylvester, but there's a manufacturing problems right now, so everything is on hold. So we still have to treat our first patient, hopefully next month. So uh, shifting gear to bladder cancer. So I'm, I selected uh, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. So this is not something medical oncologists th <laughs> oncology typically treat. It's urology disease. But it was really fascinating uh, data. And it's using this uh, interleukin-15. Uh, so bladder cancer, you know, standard for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer was BCG. It was vaccine. You know, it's used for tuberculosis vaccine, at, you know, in third world countries, and uh, it's approved since 1971 for bladder cancer. So if patient has non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, what urologists do after they remove the tumor, they install BCG. And you know, some people will fail. 30, 40 percent of people will fail. They'll try to do it again. If they fail again, they have to take the bladder out, and it's awful. And a radical cystoprostatectomy, it's really like major surgery of really affecting patient's quality of life. And so the question is what we can offer to those patients. So pembrolizumab has been approved for the last two years for those patients, but only like 20% of those patients will benefit who are BCG refractory. And then came interleukin-15, which is in, in cytokine, that uh, you know, really increased quite a bit of... An, NK cells, and uh, they combine it with BCG and ask, can we salvage those patients? So their only alternative is radical cystectomy. So that was the study and was also open at uh, Sylvester, run by Dr. Gonzalgo, that they used a uh, patient who failed BCG and then they uh, give them um, you know, interleukin-15 combination of BCG. And they have two cohorts. They have uh, carcinoma in situ plus recurrent TA, T1, and they have micropapillary, papillary, which is a very bad uh, type of subtype of bladder cancer. And the results were very impressive. So they had complete response rate, eight, 58 out of 82 patients, which is a 71%. And they're able uh, you know, to keep it in majority of patients and about 90 plus percent preserve the bladder. They didn't have to remove the bladder. And in a high-grade papillary, those are like worse players. Uh, it's still, they had a 77 patient, this study, median disease-free survival is 19 months. But after 24 months, you can see the half of the patient were still disease-free, and they were able to avoid radical cystectomy in 94 patients. So this is not yet FDA approval, but I anticipate it's going to become approved pretty soon because this is really impressive compared to pembrolizumab, which is alternative for those patients. So, uh, 
adrenocortical cancer, horrible cancer. Thank God it's very rare. It's only 0.5 patients per million. So in the United States, there's about 150 patients annually. And uh, because it's so rare disease, there's very little research done on those patients. And the, the question is, what do we do with those patients after they have uh, surgery? So surgery is only a curative option for those patients. And um, current standard is that for high-risk disease based on retrospective study from Europe, we give them mitotain. Mitotain is a horrible drug. It's DDT. It's being used in insecticides to kill mosquitoes to eradicate malaria. And it's only one indication, it's adrenocortical cancer. What they found, there is some overdose with DDT, and they found that those animals and people being overdosed, they completely lost the adrenal glands. It's completely destroyed the adrenal gland. So it has neurotoxicity, so it's a horrible drug, and people have to take it for several years, and you have to manage the level. So it's pretty painful uh, managing those patients. So for high-risk disease, uh, it's been standard of care. But for intermediate and low-risk, there's always a question, should we give them this horrible disease, or maybe we should just watch those patients? Uh, so this was the study uh, that was presented uh, last year. And they used those patients, and they, they randomized them to observation because they think maybe nothing, versus uh, adjuvant mitotain for two years. And uh, the problem was they could not accrue enough patients. You know, it's a very <laughs> rare disease. But they were halfway through accrued, and they decided to present the data because it was a negative study. So we learned that we do not need to give patients adjuvant mitotain if they have low-risk disease or uh, intermediate-risk uh, disease. So uh, those patients will offer them surveillance, and the still is recommended for high-risk disease, which is defined as a KI-67 of more than 10% or if they have more than 10 mitosis per 50 high-power field. So it's important to ask your uh, pathologist to review sli uh, pathology slides, give us these two numbers. It's like deal-breaker for us to decide are we going to give them adjuvant mitotain or not. So this is the first ever prospective randomized trial for this super rare disease. So I think it's worth <laughs> mentioning it here in this presentation. And the last is the kidney. Uh, there are lots of excitement previously in the kidney, but this is the major excitement of the uh, last year for kidney. It's Keynote 564. For the last 20 years, investigators were trying to answer questions, should we give adjuvant therapy for kidney cancer? Until this year, the answer was no, uh, because we, there's no single study. We tried everything, did work for uh, high-risk kidney cancer. So uh, this was presented uh, last, not this year, ASCO, last ASCO. This ASCO was a presented update, which showed that people were, uh, patients were randomized with high-risk kidney cancer to pembrolizumab for one year versus placebo, and they're looking for disease-free survival, which is a typical endpoint for adjuvant kidney cancer study. And it was a positive study, uh, leading to lots of excitement and to have the approval of this agent uh, for high-risk kidney cancer, it's for clear cell kidney cancer. So in summary, uh, adjuvant pembrolizumab achieved a statistically significant uh, and clinically meaningful disease-free survival, has a ratio of 0.68, and was benefit across the group. They also include a patient with M1 disease uh, at staging. So those patients who had M1 disease and underwent radical nephrectomy and metastatectomy. So they became NAD. They were also allowed to be on the study. And those patients also benefit the uh, the adjuvant uh, pembrolizumab. Overall survival data is still immature. We don't have the results there. But safety profile was very acceptable. There's nothing uh, unusual seen. We all know very well how to manage side effect of pembrolizumab. And uh, pembrolizumab now, it's a standard of care for patients with uh, renal cell carcinoma in the adjuvant settings for, for one year. I forgot to mention the only other drug approved for uh, adjuvant kidney cancer was sunitinib, but with lots of controversy because there were like two studies were positive and you know, two studies were negative, and then there was a 6-6 six, six ODAC vote uh, for sunitinib, which then was approved by the FDA, but nobody used it because it's really, we don't think the sunitinib is a uh, good drug for renal cell cancer. Uh, and on the other hand, pembrolizumab is uh, you know, widely accepted uh, as an option for, for those patients. So, uh, I'm ahead of time. I have 45 minutes, 45 seconds left. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Mario. Uh, Gina, you're welcome to join us. And uh, 
So let me, uh, this was a fantastic presentation from the both of you. Um, in, uh, you know, in renal cell carcinoma, we've gone from zero drugs to, you know, I don't know what to pick, and uh, for sarcomas, we went from, you know, you have a sarcoma, goodbye, to let me, let me check what your, uh, your profile is, and, uh, you know, we have a very tailored treatment for you um, uh, over the last 20 years, probably. So it's fantastic. Uh, questions for, for uh, the presenters and for me? Okay, let me, uh, I have questions for me from uh, the uh, uh, online audience, uh, but um, uh, I, I, I wanted um, uh, to ask uh, uh, Gina if, you know, we do, what is, what is your approach now, I mean, for a soft tissue sarcoma patient, I know that there are multiple subtypes, you know, uh, for the general practitioner, uh, the practitioner is online right now with us, doesn't have access necessarily to a tumor board. Yeah. Uh, what is your advice for the next steps uh, in the community? I, I think the, the importance is, you know, in the past, um, you know, it's a soft tissue sarcoma, and we had, you know, less than 50 different types. Now we have 175 different types of sarcoma. So it's really important that you have the tumor specimen reviewed by an expert pathologist. And you really want to get a sarcoma expert involved in the care. I don't have to see every, I can, our group, we can see the sarcoma patients. We don't have to treat everybody. We can make treatment recommendations and then you can treat them in the community. Um, so I think if you can get the tumor specimen reviewed by an expert pathologist, really get an idea of what the histology is, and then there are several treatments based on the histology. Uh, staging, um, you know, if it's a stage one or two, standard is still surgery, uh, a, a plus or minus radiation if it's stage two, no radiation needed if it's a stage one. Stage three is very controversial, and you really need to be um, looking at all the factors, the risk factors, the subtype of sarcoma, what kind of, is it sensitive to chemotherapy, uh, if you think your patient can handle the chemotherapy. And we like to do the chemotherapy neoadjuvantly so we can use the tumor as a biomarker. Uh, as a surrogate for a metastatic disease, that's part of the reason why a lot of the adjuvant trials were negative is that really some tumors are sensitive to chemotherapy and others aren't. So if we give everybody toxic chemotherapy after, we're really not, um, you know, we're obligating patients. I think you have it. And then, of course, in the metastatic setting, um, molecular profiling is so important because we can really find um, molecular targets for uh, maybe not first line or second line, but second and beyond. We have NTREC inhibitors, which um, can be very effective, and we, we've had our third NTREC uh, mutation found um, after 10 years of me um, getting molecular profiling, so we're happy about that. But um, So I, I think working with a sarcoma expert is really important, and we're, we're, we're available, um, uh, easily accessible, and if we can't get to see the patient, we can at least talk to you over the phone guide you from the initial treatment, and then see, and we can present the case at the sarcoma conference. Also, we do have, um, you know, Zoom sarcoma conference, so we welcome any community oncologists that ever want to present their case. Um, uh, we can present the case at the, at the Zoom. Thank you. Um, Mario, um, I don't know if you can tease uh, this new standard of uh, initial treatment for uh, castration-sensitive uh, prostate cancer. You know, prostate cancer is also a disease of, uh, of the older people. Uh, how do you, how do you, uh, you know, uh, present or decide on the application of triple therapy? I mean, double therapy, I think, is, uh, uh, is uh, 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 acceptable for an older person, uh, but triple therapy is a little bit more difficult. Uh, is there a definite advantage to push chemotherapy even on the, on the uh, most advanced uh, uh, older patients, provided they can tolerate it? Yeah, so I think as long as the patient is fit for those taxal chemotherapy, I think you should push the triplet. Now, based on my experience, I've treated maybe like 10 patients so far with a triplet. Um, if patient can ha handle those taxal, addition of abiraterone does not add any additional toxicity. So there are definitely a group of patients who cannot handle those taxal. A 95-year-old in wheelchair 
can handle those attacks. But if patient you think can handle, and many 85 year old who are in good shape couldn't do that, I will offer them triplet. So if patient, if I offer those attacks, I never offer it alone. It's always going to be a triplet. Thank you. Um, you know, several of the questions that I have online uh, uh, for, for me, uh, most of them have to do with myeloma. Uh, and I'm going to try to address them all together uh, if possible. Uh, they have to do with um, uh, MRD, minimal residual disease demonstration, and uh, they address mostly the, the uh, technology uh, for the diagnosis. Uh, in summary, MRD is evaluated for myeloma in bone marrow evaluation, uh, and it can be done both by genomic as well as by flow cytometry. Uh, the uh, goal is to find 10 to the minus 5 uh, or less uh, uh, malignant cells by either of the methodologies, and those have to be specified. And there's, uh, to my knowledge, uh, there may be an experimental one, but to my knowledge, there is no um, peripheral blood um, uh, uh, methodology for MRD. Uh, uh, then there is a question on uh, algorithms and maintenance uh, therapy and uh, the, the use of uh, bone marrow transplant, uh, what we call stem cell transplant right now. Uh, stem cell transfer for myeloma, transplant for myeloma is autologous stem cell transplant. Uh, both at Sylvester as well as elsewhere, we do allogeneic bone marrow transplant for myeloma, but this is experimental. Uh, uh, there is evidence that uh, allogeneic bone marrow transplant may be uh, better than uh, autologous bone marrow transplant, uh, but this is a very limited option uh, uh, given the toxicity of uh, uh, the uh, treatment as well as the toxicity of myeloma itself at the time a patient makes it for transplant. Uh, and, uh, 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 there are questions regarding maintenance and the length of maintenance after uh, transplant. Um, uh, there was an abstract uh, presented, uh, actually several abstracts presented, one on the uh, 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 oral abstract presentation regarding maintenance uh, for uh, post-transplant patients. The current standard is, uh, uh, and that's still in the recommendations, two years of lenalinomide uh, uh, maintenance following transplant. Uh, there is a consensus that uh, patients that have a high-risk myeloma going into transplant should be treated uh, with uh, a combination of uh, lenalidomide and uh, 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 either daratumumab or um, uh, uh, Velcade. Uh, uh, however, that uh, is difficult to, uh, to stomach. There was a, an abstract presented where a combination of uh, lenalidomide, uh, Velcade, and dexamethasone was used uh, for a year, uh, and those patients have an advantage in survival. Uh, the problem is to uh, judge the tolerance of uh, the V, uh, the Velcade on that uh, regimen. It's not easy. And uh, uh, finally, uh, but, but uh, maintenance treatment for two years at least uh, with lenalidomide, if not longer, is a recommendation, and probably the addition of daratumumab uh, uh, to uh, high-risk patients or uh, 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 Velcade. Uh, and finally, uh, there is a question on whether you uh, should use CAR T-cell therapy or bispecific antibodies. Um, the answer is, uh, I don't think that I know, I don't think anybody knows for sure. Uh, right now, uh, as it is, both are very toxic uh, treatment and selection of patient and selection of uh, the availability of the treatment for the patients is, uh, is uh, paramount. Uh, with the newer treatments, as I presented, it is very conceivable that we will face the, the, the dilemma of whether to treat somebody with um, uh, tailored uh, cell therapy or off-the-shelf cell therapy. Uh, but as, as it is right now, I think it's a, a question of selection of patient, if not going into a trial. I have a question for... Sure. Um, so with, that, with the trials, both with the PARP inhibitors um, and with the conflicting data, did they... Did they test differently? Uh, how did they test for DNA so they used damage co repair? Commercially available, they use the foundation medicine liquid biopsy or tissue uh, or a carrier. So it's basically the same. They use the same one. And it's just BRCA. Yeah. Uh, any other? There are ten, 10 different mutations from the DNA repair pathway. Actually, more than ten. Uh, mm -hmm. ATM uh, uh, BRCA one, BRCA two, PALB two, and several others. So any of those mutations, they enroll the patient. And because the first trial had the survival curve had much higher mm -hmm. um, difference. It was like 16 yep. than the other one. Was it first line, second line? Was no, it's it always the same one. You know, usually people that have the DNA repair pathway, they live, it's much more aggressive patient, and they can't, people live short. 
Yeah, and so, but like any explanation as to why one trial had a higher, uh, uh, you know, PFF, like there was a difference. Yes, that it the, was difference, like, the difference is also depends, you know, there's a like all multi center trial and people are coming from different countries. So it depends on the country where the patients are coming from, they're treated. Like, you know, in other countries, you know, there's not as many available. Uh, second, third line, fourth line, that treatment option for the patient. Do you think it we might assume, have been more could be, down the we, line? Yeah. We assume that all the PARP inhibitors, you know, the three that we have are the same. I think they're all the we same, you know, in that, terms of you know, efficacy. I think it's just a uh, yeah. drug-related difference. Now, um, and, uh, Gina, I had a question for you mm -hmm. regarding the uh, use of uh, uh, palbocyclib on mm -hmm. the uh, de-differentiated liposarcoma. Mm -hmm. You know, this is just thinking out mm -hmm. loud. Uh, following the breast cancer uh, um, uh, um, similarities, would anti-estrogen uh, therapy be, should be considered on this? After all, you know, uh, uh, lipid cells, lipoid cells are hormone sensitive. So, you know, we really need to be testing more androgen receptors and estrogen receptors. Sometimes we do get results back when we do molecular profiling. I know, Karis, when we, when we, when we do foundation, um, you know, we don't have in-house full next-gen sequencing, so we usually send it out to either foundation or Karis. And um, you, you have to ask specifically for estrogen and uh, progesterone receptors and androgen receptors. And I try to remember to do that, but I don't do that for everybody. Uh, we do see that about 50% of uterine leiomyosarcoma patients are estrogen positive, and we use um, some aromatase inhibitors in that setting. But um, we're not real, we're underutilizing uh, hormonal therapies in, in sarcomas because I, I think it's understudied, and that's one of the projects we would like to do. Any questions? Well, thank you very much for attending. It was a pleasure to host uh, this meeting. Thank you to our speakers. Hope to see you next year. Thank you.